I just want to go contextualize what, uh, what I do a little bit more. Previously, and even now, we are working very much, very closely to the Chinese and Korean governments on master plan projects. And most of our proposal are uh, around the idea of urban agriculture, where we try to establish uh, an ecological symbiosis between nature and the form. So the food production within this, this new, these new cities really choreograph the spatial plan. And these are a couple of examples. And this one here, we apply the same uh, idea to um, regenerating a dock site in Denmark. So, back to Food City. Food City is an investigation into urban consequences of food poetics and transparency. The book combines nostalgia of food tourism in a narrative architecture to examine food production in the urban environments. That's a picture not for the vegetarians. I think Dan showed a lot of beans from just now, so I have to do justice to the meat side of things. So this is pigs, actually fresh from Smithfield Market. I was there at 3 o'clock in the morning, not to take that picture. Um, <laughs> so, Food City investigates the rest reading statement of food at the core of national and local governments, how it can be a driver to restructure employment, education, transport, health, culture, community, and the justice system, reevaluating how the city functions as a spatial and political entity. I guess uh, for what I do, my day job, and what I teach, I guess my interest with food politics and transparency and democracy is how that would actually influence our urban environments, the build space. So, here, uh, Saskia Sassen said in an article, urban spaces emerging as sites of transformation out of the monopoly of food industry. The space in the city where the powerless can make history. That's really, really important. And I think food industry, uh, large or small, has influenced the economic status and social status of many, many cities. Historically, for example, this one is in Cork here, the Butter Exchange. Um, it has actually, you know, whatever you see there, most of it, the prosperity of it, uh, generated, was generated from the butter industry. But most importantly, and the museum, it's a museum now, they are most proud of is actually how it actually empowered women folks there to become independent. It was the first time women folk could actually work part-time, full-time employment. The same here in Accra. So the book covers around 25 different cities around the world in different aspects. Here you can see most of the, the, the characters there are women folks in Accra. The informal food growers are really, really important to feeding families, keeping price reasonable, but also bringing home an income. Here, there's another example in Salvador where women folks play a large part. So every place from we, we actually look into from India to Egypt, North Africa, South Africa, you know, women play a large, large part. Communities, communities like this one here, this is the West Bank in as we know. And the authority has been, because of the intensity of population there and a very tiny piece of land, houses and buildings are all encouraged to build flats uh, in order to have their own personal rooftop farming uh, to supplement what is the, the food shortage there. So in a way, you know, this community has a different problem here. As you can see, this is in 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 Iceland, the enemy is actually the weather. The local authority was, they were quite thick actually. They built, they spent money building an ice station rink in Inuit where you have 10 months of snow. Um, <laughs> the community basically said, fuck it, we don't want an ice station rink. So it's into a greenhouse where everybody has a lot inside. And it has proved to be very, very successful. Uh, I actually think that we have everything at our fingertips in terms of food, which makes us totally indiscriminate about how much we eat and what we eat, and we actually become slaves to supermarkets that tells us what to eat too. Here, yeah, this is hunting. We should go back to hunting. I think I want to put this idea to all of you. You know, we should actually have hunting, and we should hunt the food that we eat. We don't. If we are bad in shooting, like me, I would go vegetarian. Totally. So this is what you get if you are a hunter. On the other hand, the artist 
uh, here in Calcutta. She actually described this talk in London. Yeah, this is an entire building. It's, but if we actually um, do not actually have a say in how we, we actually control for security and safety, we might end up eating rodents in our backyard. A lot of money is spent on advertising. I mean, millions and millions. And the things that, but the information we get is not the ones that we should know, which actually increase our knowledge about what we put into our body. What we get is these sort of advertisements, these big corporate companies, um, or we get sort of sort of imagery or uh, symbolism in our architecture that represents food. This is restaurant in Thailand that sells breakfast. Yes, we all know that's fried egg. And then even the great architect friend Gary himself made a sushi restaurant in the shape of a fish. Uh, or here, the Ministry of Fishery in Korea actually had a big fair in, in the town center, in the city center in Seoul, where installations and whatnot, from screens to canopies to huts, are made of local fish. Uh, but I just think, with all that kind of wild wild room, why can't we just go back to this? I would like to talk to this chap here, this is uh, in Brazil, where, or anywhere that has a real market. Well, I can talk to this chap, he can tell me what to cook, how to cook, and what is the, the best buy of the day. On the other hand, we always say that the food industry, they are bad guys. They are not bad guys in all cases. I think some of the place, what we call paths of education knowledge in our cities, for example, Tate Modern here, and Tate Britain, and the National Portrait Gallery, Library, for example, and a lot of social housing from, you know, would not exist if not for Tate and Lau, Sugar Company, or just Brown Street that sells us all, you know, sugar, sugary, and confectionery, and Heinz, Heinz Soup, um, that sponsor the library at the National Portrait Gallery. So they're not always bad guys. Um, urban parks. Urban parks actually provide, urban parks and rooftop gardens in cities uh, provide employment. Why? Because that's, that's why we produce concrete honey. This is a scene um, on the rooftop of the Opera House in Paris. Markets are palaces of, to celebrate the relation between nature and what we can get from nature. This is a, a market in Barcelona uh, by the architect Enrique Morales. It's a refurbishment of the old shell with the new roof. The roof actually um, has this sort of pixelation uh, image of this field of vegetables. Um, I enjoy the architecture, but I enjoy the food inside the market much more. Uh, no insult to the late great architect himself. But here, you know, it's, what I want is I want the architecture to really celebrate the idea of food. Here, there's another one uh, in Rouen, in France. Look at how beautiful the roof is, reaching out to the sun, having this dialogue with, with nature. Um, you know, rather than these sort of design built fucking sheds that we get in England, they're terrible, absolutely terrible. We shouldn't go buy anything at these places. <laughs> or, on the other hand, you don't have to be bravado about the architecture. It could be this incredibly celebrated corner store tin shed with amazing graphics on that, made by the, the shopkeeper himself. So the things that, you know, there are two sides of it. Dan spoke about food waste. 30% as um, you say one third. Yeah, 30% of food waste, food produced, fruits and vegetables, they're wasted. And it's really a travesty. This is in Havron in the West Bank where children and communities have to actually scavenge for food because there's a lack of it. And when you see scenes like that, you're really, really the hardest, most nasty person would actually cry. If not outside, would cry inside. And food and energy has a really interesting relationship here. Because in the amazing melons, allegedly, I've not had it yet, uh, that's produced in Iran, Iraq, uh, Northern Africa, um, is because of this organic pigeon dropping. And they produce amazing architecture to celebrate that fact. These are pigeon, uh, architecture for pigeons. Just to collect droppings, not for meat or feathers or anything like that, just for droppings. Uh, dinner time uh, in Mumbai, as you can see here.
I didn't know we were going to get music to come to my screen. Thank you, God. Uh, here, we have a family cooking meal. Um, you know, I don't think we actually could need sort of, this is me in my village in Malaysia, uh, making dinner on a car bonnet. No, he's actually much more handsome than me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just trying to say that there are different conditions of what I call the domestic kitchen. Uh, it doesn't always have to be, you know, the Balto or the Zanuzi or whatever you buy for, you know, 10,000 pounds kitchen. Uh, on the other hand, the kitchen here, this is, I think, probably, somebody's going to correct me, but, you know, it says, in the Guinness World Record, it's, there's one which is much smaller. This one, it measures only five meters and less than a meter depth. These two old guys, uh, the collective age probably about 200, sells um, sobe, soba noodles from 3 o'clock in the morning to 6.30 uh, at Skiji Market. Skiji Market is a big fish market at the central fish market in Tokyo, and they have been there for about 100 years at least. And they actually was very curious of me taking a photo of them. They said no photo of them. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you get this vast celebration of food where in the Lagoon of Venice here. This shack here has a table for about eight people and you're taken there by boat in the middle of the lagoon uh, and then this net will drop and whatever comes up, that's your, your lunch or dinner. And uh, it really, for those of you who are architect or planet, you might know that, you know, where I teach, the Barber School of Architecture at UCL, this scheme is actually equally as dark as the schemes we produce at Barber. So, uh, here, in terms of health, we, you know, we need to be accessible to nutritional food and, and also fairly priced food, not expensive food. And these, this guy is one of many who actually make things affordable in cities, in many, many cities. Uh, this is a duck farmer who would bring his ducks from one lake to another lake. But in order to do that, um, this is in Guangzhou, China, he actually and his flocks have to cross the highway. And you get sort of six to eight lane highways where you get these lots of ducks crossing. <laughs> it's quite a scene when you see it. I always think that we are absolutely, you know, disgusted and annoyed and whatever, you know, with top-down initiatives. In Brazil, this is an amazing initiative, the Restaurant Popular. It's um, law number 6352 in Brazil. It actually says, Every Brazilian citizen is entitled to a nutritional meal a day, and it costs one dollar. And so, rich, poor, in the middle, whatever, they come here to have a nutritional meal. And this scheme has actually, um, is not just about feeding, but it's also about growing, about education, and so forth. And it's all uh, started off. And by doing so, what he has done is has reduced the national health bill by quite substantially. So it's cheaper to keep your citizens and community healthy than to actually kill them through medication. I just want to finish off very quickly. Um, you know, from all the research, that is all in the book, and, and, and so is this project, which becomes the kind of the, the, the finish, uh, the, the rounding up of the research that we've done. This is not what my project, I wish it is. It's a great building, shit people inside it. Um, <laughs> this is our building. Uh, this is, I have to say, I'm a very well person. So, um, and here, this is our food parliament. The food parliament is actually a fictional supreme food legislative body for London. It's about 3.5 kilometers square. It sits above the old London wall. Um, floating over London City. It's a secondary infrastructure, uh, functions as a holistic ecology, um, and actually has a symbiotic dialogue with the city below, which is London. And it has three pleasures. One is to do with promoting the city as the world's leading international center of excellence. Second is to facilitate local communities and individuals in cultivation, processing, and distribution. And third, probably is the most important, is to disseminate the new notion of wealth. The new notion of wealth is not the money in the pocket, but actually the new, is to do with nutrition, health, um, green spaces, fresh air. These are the things that we really, really should care about and actually should encourage our MPs and our local council to really, really um, look into. The Food Parliament is a transformational tool to real London's potential response to the omnipresent energy crisis and contributes to the discourse around food politics and the urban utopia. I'm just going to show you a couple of characters. Uh, 
the thing is that the project was actually done uh, when our MP were actually voted by us. Uh, we're using our money to buy dump huts and pay for the third home and, and so forth. So it was a satirical critique of that moment. But also, we're using this to say, you know, if these policies could be implemented in food policies, food security could be implemented within politics itself, rather than to be sidelined, it might become something that would be beneficial for all of us. So Westminster Hall, for example, this is an image of the coronation banquet of uh, George IV in 1821. And so instead of eating, we actually produce food on, on this sort of pyramidal structure here. And if you're standing on, on the street of London, you look up, that's what you see. Um, all of that moves to become the blue carpet where uh, that you get fish farming. The department of health will be these whole series of structures that sit along the embankment uh, that actually bake the pie of uh, new wealth. And the new wealth pies will then be, be stocked up with, uh, um, will be inside the, the coat of the MP, these are the MPs, which then will be rolled out to the different constituency to distribute the knowledge of good health and good um, good nutrition. So they are kind of metaphoric. You need to see these as sort of metaphoric tectonics pieces. Uh, the, the river is drained out. What you get is the pixelation out. Is, uh, they are made of anaerobic digesters where the organic waste is then pumped back north and south as a joint project uh, of the city to create gas. The, this is Mr. Speaker here um, that would actually control the environment. There's a big, big banquet square, which is the table of house where you can, this is where the celebration of the harvest would happen. The MP basically are these sort of uh, vision towers, but they are out there to bring communities together. This image is fantastic. This is a big infrastructure of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, where they actually close it up for a day for the big breakfast. Uh, so NGOs, restaurants, um, food nutritionists, everybody, anybody who is into and sort of uh, policy makers and food and, and so forth, they come here, they actually discuss and enjoy food for one day. And it's absolutely amazing when you see it. So that's MP. So that's it. Thank you very much.